Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm Rhonda Brown, and uh, with my husband, Tom Grotta, we've been operating Brown Grotta Arts for in Wilton, Connecticut for many years. We have been very pleased to represent the work of Jin Jalaki for, for many, many years. And also, we've been thrilled to work with the Flynn Gallery in Greenwich, which is currently hosting an exhibition called Wordplay of her work and that of John McQueen's. Ginge has been called a word whisperer. Her highly individual and puzzle-like assemblages help to propel the growth of the contemporary fiber arts movement. Her work and her art traverse a, an extraordinary personal journey. And you'll learn more about that today. And so now, without further ado, um, here is Ginge. Hello. I'm really very, very pleased to be here. And I'm very, very pleased to be involved in this um, exhibition at the Flynn Gallery. Um, it is uh, it is really just my kind of thing. Word play, I play with words, I love playing with words. And messages in Branch and Bark, I feel, um, I will talk more specifically about that because I, I think there are many messages for all of us in Branch and Bark. So right now I will begin a screen share and I will tell you a little bit about myself and my work and let's hope it all works according to plan here. There we go. Uh, you should be seeing my images. So um, I started out by saying that um, I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1944, amidst the war. It was a very, very difficult time. After the war, a couple of years later, my father was driven out of Hungary in the trunk of a diplomatic car. Um, he had been working with the American legation in uh, Budapest after the war. So it was, it was a rough time. My two brothers and my mother and I basically walked to Austria took about a week, it was raining, it was difficult. So that was my beginning. But I must say, um, my next slide <laughs> was going to show you the Statue of Liberty because we sailed into uh, New York Harbor and uh, my first excite excitement was the vision of Lady Liberty welcoming us. Ginge, you should be able to share your slides now. All right, let's see if that can happen. And it looks like it can happen and we'll play. And are you seeing my slide? Okay, that was the beginning. Yes. So there is Lady Liberty. So um, what I wanted to talk about with these two slides was not just that I, I was so delighted and excited to be in the United States as a five-year-old, but also that I'm showing you a diverse range of my medium. That Lady Liberty is being renovated there. It's a New York Times photo, which I love. It's basically a net, but it's a rigid net. And we build buildings like that to this day. I think um, human beings were able to uh, harvest twigs in the landscape and build all kinds of things. They also were able to harvest in the landscape and make linear elements like the one I'm sitting on. After a year in um, India, postgraduate work, I um, came back to Berkeley and I opened an art center called Fiberworks um, in Berkeley. And it was a delightful place with a gallery and classes and many people involved. And there I am sitting on one of my favorite linear elements. But linear elements have had a long life in humans' um, existence. This is in the Andes, and these rope bridges are still being made today because there are areas that could not be connected without them. Every two to three years, they are remade. The rope is made pretty much the way one spins. Now, spinning is so tremendously important to us. Well, specifically to me, because this is my other favorite textile, the Golden Gate Bridge. Without spinning, we would not have those cables. Those cables are just under 30,000 wire strands and they are twisted. 
the twisting of those strands means that they grab onto each other and they're terribly strong, but they don't break. They do, however, give a little bit so that as the bridge bounces, which it does, it will not crack and break. It has flexibility built into it. And I understand that in Japan, there are many buildings that are built with foundations that are pretty much based on basketry ideas that also retain flexibility. And therefore, when there are earthquakes, they will, they will be flexible and bounce a little bit, but not break and crack. We look out on that beautiful, wonderful textile I adore. Um, this is my husband, Tom and me, and um, it's a view that, that sustains me and inspires me daily. But I have done my own rope making. I have, um, in 2016, I was invited to Italy just north of Venice, um, and I decided to be inspired by Shimanawa, which is a Japanese um, rope making that happens for Shinto uh, places uh, that are sacred. They are welcoming, they're protecting, they're purifying. I selected the largest tree along the water and I decided to do that kind of um, recognition and acknowledgement and love of that tree by making uh, a rope grid for it. And I have made rope before. This was much earlier in 1989 in Manchester. At that time, we were throwing away the end rolls of printing processes. You know, there's a big, there's a big roll that, that you print on. You roll out as the printing happens. And if you have a little bit left over, which could be even like a foot in diameter, you cannot start a new press run because it would go out immediately. You would run out of paper. So we were throwing these out. I decided because I'm an environmentalist way deep in my heart and also care about sustainability and trying to work on these kinds of issues, I decided that I would do um, some work putting, um, making, making this handmade rope, which was about four inches in diameter out of the end um, rolls of paper in a place that was known for its textile production and became very, very wealthy um, long ago. The last mills in Manchester had closed in the late seventies. So being there in the late eighties, I was still finding people up and talking to me in the park and art students and all kinds of um, people who wanted to make, make this rope and become involved. But I heard sad stories about my aunt lost her job in 1978 as that mill closed. So I learned something about Manchester and about textiles I did not know. Manchester became so important because it rained every day. No one told me it would rain every day. So when it rained, we would continue. However, one afternoon, the sun came out. Anyway, and what I realized was that the moisture in the air in Manchester meant that the threads would not break. So it's interesting to me how this field and my medium intersects so much with human beings and human endeavor. I did make other kinds of linear elements. The Federal Art and Ar Architecture Program asked me to make a large piece for the um, Social Security Administration here in California near me. So I decided to make my own rope. And I made a very large 25 foot long piece, which is there to this day. And I do love weaving. Weaving is another aspect of my medium, which I, I love. And of course, we all know now, I think that uh, loom weaving was the precursor of creating computers. This is an area just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. I was invited to Excellence Arts Center. This area is 
it was actually and is dotted with the remnants of preparations for military invasion. So I wanted to darn the landscape. I'm a little bit megalomania-ish about work sometimes. The, these were large pieces, red, yellow, and blue on the landscape. And the largest basket I ever made is about 16 feet across, a suspended basket. I'm not the only one though. Nellie Burke in um, 1898 created this beautiful need to be someone living in California, Northern Texas people all over California made very, very beautiful artwork and basketry and all sorts of extremely innovative things. This um, is so inspiring. I went to school at UC Berkeley and the um, Anthropology Museum there has over 8,000 baskets made by indigenous people, uh, native Indian people all over California. Many, there were many. Being uh, seven and contemporary applications this is Buckminster Fuller's piece, his building for the Expo in 1967 in Montreal. And basically, I think, and someone even said this was true, that he loved basketry. This is an upside down basket made with triangles. And if you look to the far left, about a third of the way up, you'll maybe be able to spot a figure sitting there. That is the walkway into the building. So you can see how very big this was. And I do like geometry. I'm very interested in it. And I, I often, as I make things, um, I work with a cardboard or I work with a paper pattern to try to figure things out. I made three different sizes of an N for no, and they turned out to spiral in a very interesting way. So I was making a no as I was asked to become chair of the art department at UC Davis. Um, I, I don't know why I did this right away, but <laughs> I didn't say no, I said yes. Then when my term was over, I suddenly began making a yes. Of course, it's a little bit prickly yes, it's stuck with nails. It's about 30 inches high. It's a little fuzzy, so it's a little funny. And yes, can be many different things. Um, I, I, maybe I was feeling that I should have stayed on and said yes for another term. The largest word I ever made was ART. It was um, selected for um, the Lausanne International Exhibitions. I think they went on for many years, including maybe the late 90s. So this was my contribution. My mother spoke probably five different languages. I spoke German and Hungarian as a little child. And when I came to the US, I picked up English quickly. I studied French and became fluent later. My father spoke, I think, four languages. He was educated in the US and so he spoke English as well. So language and words and letters were a big part of my life. Well, this was the biggest word that I have made to date. I collected lots of branches from all over Northern California. And of course, it was a big piece. So many of my artist friends came to help and help me finish the piece on time and send. Collecting twigs made me very cognizant of how difficult farm labor is and made me understand and appreciate the people who work so hard to put food on our tables. Fortunately, Perry Ellis understood how dusty and difficult it is. So he made a wonderful outfit for us to collect in. And I do love the branches themselves. Sometimes I'm just a little bit funny about it. So I made this small piece um, just stating twig as I love them so much. You'll see this in the exhibition.
this, if you can read it, it says eternal, it's eternal vigilance, which was um, basically a, a speech made for the Lord Mayor of London. Oh, not London, excuse me, Dublin in 1790. Many of our politicians have used this. I love this combination of words because eternal vigilance is what we need to protect our wonderful little blue green sphere that we live on. So in crisis at the moment. And there are many things that happen. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about part of this. On the far left, you'll see how we burn the prunings from our orchards. I drove by these all the time going to UC Davis where I was teaching on the faculty. And it was like driving by an art supply store. <laughs> ah, a few tears were shed now and then. These branches are beautiful hardwoods. Um, we grow all sorts of things, apricot, peach, walnut, pear, apple, many things uh, in California and Northern California. In the middle, you'll see what we've been plagued with as a result of the climate crisis. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a morning that was so smoky here that our day at 10 o'clock was basically the darkest orange you see in that image. But on the lighter side, a storm actually dropped a nice branch next to my office at Davis one day when I was teaching. And of course I have my loppers with me always. So out I went and made a nice collection for me to bring back to the studio. And yes, my husband did get me a chainsaw once. I love this cartoon mm -hmm. <laughs> by um, Farside. It's, it's uh, how I felt sometimes coming home from Davis as I loaded up my car with the wonderful things that I found along the way. But I'm not the most wonderful collector in the world. Um, in India, a country that I love and I learned so much while there, these people know how to stack the collecting of wood they do. I thought this was so magnificent. I do love basketry and basketry has taught me so much. I really understand construction and how to put things together. This I call cradle to cradle. It's about the idea that we shouldn't be throwing things out. We should be using them and reusing them and finding new uses for them. I have um, done a lot of basketry. I love it. I like its symbolism. I feel as if it does contain the soul. Imagine what it would be like to be a human being before anyone figured out how to make a basket. Imagine that you had to carry all the berries you could harvest in just your two hands. So basketry must have been a very, very important development right from the beginning. My baskets don't hold anything though. Many baskets are made for specific purposes, but I learned so much from them that I was actually able to every now and then um, increase the scale. I was invited to Austria to um, do some land art. This I call um, protest because just before this happened in 2000, a very right-wing um, Nazi sympathizer, Jörg Haider, was elected to office in a province in Austria. So the artists and I um, were talking amongst ourselves, emailing and, and uh, just discussing that maybe we shouldn't do this exhibition. But then speaking with curators and artists, we all agreed that the, the right-wing in Austria hated contemporary art. And so we thought, no, we need to go ahead and make the works that we had planned. I, responding to what was going on, decided I would make a no. I didn't want to make it too obvious, so I made a large O and a small N lying down near it. People in Vienna were actually putting the English word no in their windows to complain. Now I want to take you into my studio. We'll take a little break here. It'll be a little bit like cooking shows. 
I do believe this video will start any minute now, if all goes well. Uh, we've had a little trouble with tech, so um, hard to know what will happen here. Ah, yes, okay. I tend with my bandsaw to cut small pieces. These are apple. I bring them into my studio and I handle them a lot so that I get to know them, but I also need to do a little very fine sanding around the edges. It's not very rough around the edges, but even a little bit of a roughness can sometimes break the bark. And I like keeping the bark on the branches. Then I um, have been painting branches recently, and you'll see that in some of the work that's in the exhibition. I wanted to show these up close so you could see the different colors and the different shapes that I play with. Now, once they're painted, I have the opportunity to put them together. So sometimes I put two or three pieces together, and then I decide where I'm going to attach another piece to it. And attaching them, I have been using screws lately. So I drill a hole. You'll hear my little drill. And I just started a little bit, you know, I call this air drilling and air screwing because since these pieces are odd shapes and since I put odd shapes together, I can't really use a vise or uh, a woodworking table. I sometimes have a little block of wood that I can use uh, that helps me uh, with the shapes and helps me to hold things in place. I have to be very careful. Uh, sometimes they slip, so I have to hang on carefully. Then I, I make these um, groupings. In this case, I'm putting commercial wood together with natural branches, something that I'm, um, in fact, just working on now because I have um, rarely done that. I've done it a few times, and I'm intrigued by the juxtaposition of the two. So here I am. I'm adding a little bit more. And I work um, bending over the table because um, I, I need the pressure to push down. And I also need to look down to see the arrangement and decide where things go. So you see, I can make something much larger and yet it's still a component part. I can then put these component parts together that is a, a pretty big piece there. And I have another one on the table. And so I can then uh, build with these parts that are already starting to be assembled. Here are a couple more that are waiting to be included. So now I'd like to show you another way of working. And actually I might use pieces like that in it. I make a paper pattern. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. With that paper pattern, I then cut out a cardboard that is that shape if I'm pleased with it. And I actually end up often making a box. <laughs> so here is my box. Um, it's been in the oven, so it's all ready to go. And um, what this allows me to do is to make a very clean edge. So I, I put together pieces that are very carefully fitted to that edge. And then, um, and actually you'll see, you'll see a little bit of that uh, in the exhibition in the Flynn. I'd like to show you some of the different kinds of wood I work with. This is ash and behind me, you'll see an ash piece. Um, also, which is painted white pieces of ash. They're very interesting. I work with manzanita. Now manzanita is beautiful. It's got a purplish kind of bark to it, a reddish purplish brownish, uh, very interesting shapes. 
One problem with manzanita, which is all over California, is that it burns very hot. So when we have our fires, it's, it's a big problem. This is eucalyptus. We have a lot of eucalyptus here, a particular favorite of mine. I think you'll see a piece with eucalyptus in the collection as well. And now I want to show you something I haven't figured out, but I want to make um, a piece that is based on currency for Iran. And it's made with large safety pins. Well, thinking about my materials, I think about how much they mean to me and how closely I feel connected to branches and trees, and in fact, nature in general. When Tom and I see a truck full of um, cut lumber, logs, heading to be um, milled, we often call them tree bodies. And I was so astounded. I've been finding out reading that trees do somehow communicate with one another and maybe other plants do as well. And recently I read an article that Israeli scientists were able to record sounds that were made by plants. So I'm really intrigued by our relationship to these materials in our environment. Well, I was inspired by that piece. And so I did have to make, ouch, I made this about the time of the 2016 election. So you can think whatever you'd like to think about it. It's not a large piece, it's about 10, 12 inches high. I wanted to show you a little more in my studio because what you saw earlier was just one of the ways or a couple of the ways that I work. I made this large urn um, because I wanted to make something inspired by the ancient oil, olive oil urns in the Middle East. I decided not to close the top because I like the idea of openness and uh, something more might happen in the future. But also I was able to make a few other pieces with it. So you'll see another piece that's, um, actually um, mulberry. Someone called me and said they're trimming the mulberry in their garden. I sometimes work in very strange ways. I had a favorite traffic cone. And one day I decided to use apple, paint it and make a basket using um, my lovely traffic cone. This is the result. And lo and behold, I didn't realize at the beginning, but I painted the interior, the ends of the pieces, the exact color of that traffic cone. I sometimes wonder about how my mind works, and I always am interested in understanding more about how all of us, how our minds work. My work addresses the core issues of the interface of gender politics and contemporary basket weaving, he explained, but I will explain. This piece, can you read it? The top is an L. The next standing is an A. Lying down is a G. If you start with a G, you can spell gal. If you start with an L, you can spell lag. And indeed, I, um, well, in 1996, California passed a proposition which said, Never again will we give preference to any gender or ethnic or racial group. Um, okay, but suddenly we stopped hiring women at the University of California and stopped hiring people of color. So my friend in the law school and I, we'd been working on affirmative action for years. We decided we had to address this problem. We got three hearings in the legislature and actually, in 2005, the University of California system said to lack in hiring women was a title in the New York Times as the article um, discussed what was going on and the difficulties we were facing. We've made great headway, but I must admit that we need to make more efforts and be more successful. Ah, so. We actually ended up four to 500 faculty joined our effort. Uh, we had newsletters to inform them what was going on and to get their help and include them and get their wisdom. 
So um, we ended up naming it. Um, I came up with CAFE, California Academics for Equity. The darker it gets, the stronger it becomes. And this piece reminds me of that. It's made with coffee stirrers and I call it coffee break. I made this while being artist in residence in Maine at Haystack. So often I feel as if um, my emotions emerge through my artwork. And I do hope that people are attracted to what I do and allow themselves to feel something and to think things often way beyond anything I had planned or imagined. This piece I call sympathy. It's the word awe, A up on top, standing on the W. It is in the exhibition, you'll be able to view it. When I looked at it put together like this, I thought it's a little bit like a temple and, and that kind of fit with what I was feeling. Awe for me is awe, isn't it wonderful? Awe, what a darling child. Awe, oh, that's too bad. Awe, oh, I wish this weren't happening. To me, it's a kind of composite. And so it allowed me to think about the good things in life and the difficult things in life of which we face many. One of the difficult things happened in 2003 when I opened our newspaper here in San Francisco. And suddenly it flashed on me the leaving, the being a refugee out of my own country, Hungary. Um, I, I was just touched by this vision uh, about a war that did not have to happen. So somehow this is very unlike the kind of work that I do, but I made a four foot high kind of child soldier, cut up babies of all colors um, in response. I also started making the word war. I was invited to an international exhibition in Poland. Very excited I was because my mother was part Polish, half Polish, half Hungarian. This is Christopher Hill giving me an award. I didn't expect an award for the word war, um, but he presented that to me. Interestingly, he became the ambassador. He was the ambassador in Poland at the time. Christopher Hill became the ambassador in Iraq, um, just a couple of years later, wonderful man. So my word war, Tom Grotta did a beautiful job photographing it in all of its various forms. And I was so intrigued that the um, versions of it all kind of are in keeping with the harshness of the word itself. I was asked to make a for the word war for um, a lawyer here in San Francisco. He was very excited about it. I was kind of surprised that um, he wanted that on his wall, but okay. I happened to begin with A and about a month into it, he called me and he said, oh, Ginge, I don't think I can have that word on my wall. And I, I understood because we were learning more and more about how terrible war is and was at that time and is again, unfortunately. Fortunately, I began with A and in discussing this with Rod, we decided on Pax. Um, that's the goddess of peace. And that somehow felt very, very good to both of us. Later, I was asked to make a piece for some financial advisors, and I thought, oh, no, I don't, I don't do money. I don't, I don't make money. Uh, I don't create <laughs> artwork. But then I started to think about the war, and I started to think about the treasure, not only in human lives and livelihoods and schools and hospitals and roads and uh, all the damage that can be done by um, military action at wartime. And so suddenly I thought, okay, I'll make a, a charcoal dollar sign and put little soldiers in it. I think we're up to 6 trillion. Yes, I think it's 6 trillion in cost of the war um, as of the most recent article that I read. I wanted to show you a little bit more because 
about my studio process because that piece actually got me very interested in international currencies. So this is very analog. Um, I, I don't have any tech difficulties with this device. I bought it for $10 because UC Davis was getting rid of all its overhead projectors. And this was in its um, uh, discarded furniture barn. And you can see some of the paper patterns that I was creating to make some of the pieces that I later made. Another dollar sign, you can make up your own um, ideas about what it might mean. Uh, but that was uh, actually, uh, the Euro was adopted in 96. And in 2010, as you can see on, on this um, article, um, Mr. Kumar was selected to be the designer of the new image, the new symbol for the rupee. They had been using RS because the Brits had been there locking India down for 310 years. Now the economy was becoming strong and they wanted their own symbol. If you Google international currencies, this will pop right up. Well, not to be outdone, a couple of years later, Turkey said, our economy is incredibly strong and we too want a symbol. What's interesting to me about these is that symbols like these become an international language as do a number of other things. Even the stop sign, we know that that is understood in many parts of the world. It got me thinking about art as well. And I thought, I thought that possibly art functions somewhat like symbols, an immediate take, and then you add in your understanding from that view. By the way, a friend gave me a group of baby arms, hands, and I had them for four or five years and suddenly they became just the right thing. I got more, all different colors, and I call this piece Reach. Actually, Turkey is an intersection internationally and has been for civilizations for millennia. So it seemed, seemed appropriate. This is U-Turn. I like the arrow. It's another um, symbol that seems to have lots of meaning depending where and how it happens. I was invited to Bulgaria um, in 2005 and I decided they, they were recovering from their time as part of the um, Iron Curtain under Soviet dominance. And um, so this piece is natural branches at the bottom and then recycled pieces from buildings that were being torn down or renovated. And the whole community got involved. It was really a wonderful experience and um, a delight to work with the people who I met and who wanted to be involved. It was the idea of moving up and upwards I find um, some symbols in strange places. This question mark I found on an old wall in Chinatown. I photographed it and I started making that um, question mark because it just was such a wonderful shape. And the war was still um, on my mind. I went to school when the Vietnam War was happening. I was born in a war in 2000s. We had another war. Um, the Korean War. So somehow or other, the G.I. Joes jumped into this and it became a devil and it has um, small soldiers painted red in it. The exclamation mark now in the Crocker Museum's permanent collection also, you can see the little soldiers in that. This was um, a piece that I made for the um, Embassy residents in Warsaw, I was asked to make a piece for um, that exhibition, exhibitions that are done in the embassies, uh, the US embassies. It's wonderful that they do these art exhibitions. It is again, a combination of, construct, of, of commercial construction wood in the bottom and natural branches in the top. It is now in the somewhat recently built new Kosovo embassy on a permanent basis. Speaking of symbols, I fell in love with the ampersand. 
The ampersand to me is a connector. It means more is coming. It, it, it gives you a pause. It, it, um, it includes things. It happens in wonderful ways. I do think the font designers, maybe by the time they got to the end and had to make the ampersand said, oh, that was hard. I think I'll have fun now. And so you can find ampersands that are lyrical, beautiful, and um, an amazing variety. This ampersand was on a business card someone gave me, and it was so poorly printed that it was um, fuzzy. And I thought, well, how interesting, a fuzzy ampersand. This is Monique on the left and Bo Choi on the right. Mo and Bo, um, I have young people, students and others who sometimes, not always young, sometimes my friends want to come see how to make things and spend time with me in my studio. It's been a great pleasure um, throughout my um, life as an artist that um, I like it. I like to show people, I like to tell them about what I do. And if anyone wants to come cut sand, screw holes or add nails, I am happy to welcome you. That piece was in the NATO embassy residence. This man, Ivo Dalder and his wife, um, Elisa Harris, um, a scientist who studies weapons of mass destruction. They were the couple who asked to have one of my pieces in their exhibition. They loved it. They took it home at the end. And I was so delighted, although it was because of the war in Ukraine that Ivo Dalder was on the news. Perhaps you've seen him making his very astute and thoughtful comments. He never did turn and say, and this piece on the wall is by Ginge. <laughs> but I was very delighted that I was a participant in these moments. I do wordplay. I wordplay often. This piece is actually a word that is four different languages. I call it to dream. It's the word ever. And in French, it's rev. It's made with telephone wire. Rev, R-E-V-E, -E, means to dream. Vere in Latin or Italian is truth, truthfulness. Ah, but four letters, it should be four words. I was showing it to a young woman who came to spend time with me from Mexico City. She was going to school in um, the Bay Area. And suddenly I realized I was disappointed in this piece because I needed that fourth word and it was not there. She said, oh, Ginge, it's Hebrew. If you spell it the way we do, it's Erev. Erev is a wonderful word. Erev means kind of a, an opening, a greeting, a beginning. It also means a number of other very interesting things. Woof, as in weft, as in weaving. It also means to mix, to intermingle, to intersperse, to involve someone. I was delighted beyond belief. And um, it is definitely one of my playing with words, wordplay that I feel wonderful about and so enjoy. Now, if any of you have a word that can be in many different languages, please, please, please contact me immediately. I would like to do this again, but it's hard to do. Uh, you know, strange things happen all the time. This is a small piece, line, L-I-N-E. I'm so interested in what it takes to read and sometimes how little it takes to read. Um, this is again, something that touched me deeply because a woman purchased it who a little while later became blind. And I don't know how these things happen. But let's go on to how easy it is to read with just a line or two. The first letter in the upper left is an N, then an A and a T. And maybe you can read the rest naturally. So I'm intrigued by language symbols, how we use them, how we understand them, how they play a part in our lives. A young boy, maybe I think he was eight or 10 years old, uh, was having a very hard time in school. He, he really, he was a bit dyslexic. He had a hard time writing. 
And for some reason, his parents decided to put him in a Japanese immersion school. And suddenly he could write Japanese in a way that people could read it. I was so intrigued by this article. I'm also intrigued by the little drawing of two people, how we communicate with each other, which is, I would say, one of the kind of deeply seated things about um, my desire as I create the works that I create is that I will have the ability to communicate with others. This I call notes to self. I'm playing around with that idea of, of, of just a mark and how it might be expressive. So then I tried a really large piece. And what was fascinating about this large piece was that it actually, people walked into the studio and said, oh, is that a symbol system? Oh, does that mean something? And you can see the ash pieces that I use, there are a couple of them on the left, how expressive they can be. While I was artist in residence in Maine at Haystack, they had created something called a fab lab with MIT students. This is um, one of the students who was there. Um, his name is Kenny Chung, a brilliant guy, and he had brilliant colleagues. They took that large piece on the wall, a photograph of it, and they cut it out, cut out those pieces in many different materials, cardboard on the lower right. And then they cut it out in all kinds of sizes. And some were teeny tiny, but the slightly larger ones, I was able to, again, with insect pens this time, put them into the wall and create the word now. And now again, that's a little bit of a nod to our climate situation. Oi, yes, probably also. This piece I finished at the very beginning of the pandemic. And lo and behold, the world works in such weird ways. This car, as I was finishing it, came and parked in front of my studio for several days. It is a strange world. But it reminds me now with this pandemic that we're all in this together. Albert Camus, I bought that paperback in 1963 when I was in France for a year. And, and suddenly my book club asked that we read that. So I read it again in French. But you can see me in my studio wondering what comes next, how to behave, how to protect myself. Fortunately, things have gotten better. I did make a piece called Variant. The very large, um, huge, extra large golf tees in it are a nod to Trump. I love making things. I decided to take all my small tools and lay them out with the word make. I encourage you to make. Human beings are so creative. We are, um, that must be one of our major aspects to who we are and how we behave and how we think. So please make. The book you will find in the Flynn Gallery. It's, it's um, and, uh, uh, just a pleasure that this was so beautifully designed and produced by um, Tom Grotta and Rhonda Brown. So I invite you to go look at it. I also invite you to go look at the exhibit maybe many times. It's um, going to be an exhibit with an additional wordplay, which is the discussion of John McQueen's pieces with my pieces. I feel as if they talk to each other. I admire his work. I've known his work for many years and I'm delighted to be included in this exhibition. There's another exhibition which should not be missed if you're anywhere near or in Connecticut. Acclaim, this is really a museum quality exhibition of award-winning international artists who are represented by Brown Grata Arts. So we will have a little Q&A and I do hope <laughs> that my Wi-Fi continues for a few minutes longer. Thank you so very much. Great. Okay, we're going to bring you back. I'm and, here. <laughs> okay, we've got some questions in the chat. So I'm going to start with those. And then after that, people can raise their hands with the reaction key. Um, 
Someone asks, what kind of paint do you use to paint the wooden pieces? Is it house paint? Uh, I have used house paint. Uh, I, I sometimes get, um, you know, house paint will be taken back to a paint store and then there's a half a can of this and half a can of that. And I like that, but I use acrylic uh, most of the time, uh, just like Liquitex or, or something like that. I use it very thin and I put on sometimes two, three, four, five layers because I want the character of the wood to be able to come through it. So I don't use it very thick because then it looks sort of like plastic on the surface. And Karen has asked, what is the circular box made of and why was it in the oven? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was trying to make a joke about cooking shows. You know, uh, <laughs> what happens is, is, you know, you see the person cutting up the onions and then pretty soon you see the person mixing the onions with something and pretty soon they're pulling the whole completed piece or, or, or casserole out of the oven. And, and it's only been, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes of, of air time. <laughs> so I was thinking of that to show you how I put things together because it does take quite a little time to um, tape the sides, the cardboard sides on those boxes. Um, all, all the way to the left and, and down below, you'll see the leg of a W right down there. That's a box. So I, I make, if I want a really clean edge, now the exclamation mark behind me was just made on a paper pattern on the table. I'm actually getting quite good at making a very clean edge, but it's a lot easier in a box. Well, it's hard to work in a box, but it's much easier to have a clean edge. And um, someone has asked, where did the red scent piece uh, come made from? What's, what's the red scent piece made from? It's actually made from commercial molding, uh, commercial wood. And um, it has um, black screws in it. And, and what's kind of edgy about that piece, which is also um, in uh, the Reamer collection of um, currency artworks. Um, I, I turned a lot of the screws around. So it is all these terribly sharp screws are pointing outward as well. And I call it the red scent. Um, I, uh, I guess my relationship to the economy and money is, is varied. Um, I feel as if there are lots of problems. Um, and of course, poverty is maybe one of the, or the big one um, in terms of the economy. So sometimes, sometimes I like to just suggest that. So that piece is dangerous, even though it's a penny. And someone asks if you'll be coming to the East Coast to teach because they've enjoyed the presentation so much. Thank you so much. I just turned 79. I, I think I'm maybe past my teaching days. <laughs> um, but keep in touch. <laughs> okay, so that exhausts the questions that are in the chat, although there are lots of nice comments and we'll make sure that Jen sees them all. So thank you so much. Um, if you have another question, if you'll use the raise your hand, we'll unmute you and give you a chance to ask it. Okay, well, we'll unmute everyone in case you don't want to <laughs> use the hand raise. There's yeah. one person with a hand raised. Oh, oh. she's ra a, a real hand raise. Okay, that's Marie. Uh, okay, blue green. <laughs> blue okay. green sweater. Um, Jen, this is so amazing. So amazing. Um, it's Marie Bass here. I, um, I just wonder, you know, you seem to have a thousand ideas every day, but a writer often has sort of writer's block. I mean, do you ever just wake up and think, I don't have any fresh ideas today? Or do you always have these incredible bursts of creativity? Does that happen to you, it happen every day? This is an excellent question. Uh, a really, um... I'm so glad you asked it because, well, one aspect of my response is that I learned 
while being a faculty member at UC Davis for all those years. I learned every day. But one of the things I learned early on, maybe because I was encouraging that with the students was, I found that all I had to do was put my hands on something. I could take a sheet of paper and just rip it. And pretty soon, the part of my brain that is, is connected to human creativity took over. And interesting things would start happening. Now, I don't know if that's the same for a writer. Just write a sentence and, and, and the juices will start flowing. I don't know. I find I, I, I can write, but it's painful, it's hard. <laughs> but if I just pick up some materials, uh, almost anything, um, it, it, it starts allowing my brain to move away from the kind of, um, the kind of brain activity that gets us through a day, the list of what has to be done, um, the phone call that has to be made, it's a different part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so you need to somehow connect to it. And, and because I'm a sculptor, if I put my hands on something, mm -hmm. it, it begins pretty readily. So what I would recommend is if you want to make things, it just, just put your hands on something. And I would guess even a really, a, a person who loves to cook could do that. Just open the fridge and get something out. And I, I'm sure the thoughts will start moving. One of the artists that I um, liked a lot, um, no longer living, um, Destabler here in the area, um, <laughs> had a very interesting comment in a catalog, which was, I go into my studio at eight in the morning every day. And sometimes I go into the studio and at two o'clock, I wanna just say, nothing's happening, I'm getting out of here. And then suddenly things start happening. I just put my hands on some of the clay and, and off I go. Um, it doesn't take me that long. I've found that, that I, can just, I can just grab something and, and get started. So I would recommend <laughs> that you try that. Very interesting. Thank you. Another question from the chat. Um, have, have I seen your question mark in scenes from the series Silicon Valley? Ah. Silicon. Uh, who knows? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I've made a few question marks. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's called Silicon Valley. I'll have to, I'll have to try. <laughs> That's a film? No, it's a series. TV. A series. A series. Oh, I'll have to look. Um, I, uh, one, one person somewhere locally did one day make a, a piece that was very similar to something I had made. And, um, you know, it's shocking. You go, oh, you know, hey, that's, that's like my work. But on the other hand, I'm delighted because that was a while ago and I'm, I'm making all sorts of other things now. So how nice that somebody got that inspired and maybe it was a little cheaper than something I might've made. Maybe it fit the circumstances better. Um, I learned long ago not to worry about things like that. I, I, I'm just happy that people make things and, and that there is more creativity in the world. And, and I do, I do get new ideas and I, I'm, um, I'm constantly sort of eager for the next next thing that pops up. Okay. Um, well, I did speak a little longish because of that glitch in the beginning. Forgive me. Um, I'm glad we were able to have this time together. Thank you so much for attending. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>